Well, good morning and welcome to Southside Bible Church. Uh, grateful for anyone who's visiting. Parker family, good to see you guys, kids. Love you. A couple people who helped start the church, Lee and Angie Shank, are visiting back with us. Welcome to them. It's just good to have everybody here in the family. Uh, we're going to continue in our worship now through the proclamation of the Word of God. If you'll turn to Romans chapter 11, we're currently working through that. This morning we'll find ourselves in verses 16 through 24. Uh, we're going to lock in now until I finish the chapter, put on your seatbelts. Uh, that will be the next seven weeks, and then I'll ride off into vacation. So let's dig in, and I just want to give you a warning ahead of time. I'm a little fired up this morning, so just bear with me. We are looking at the grace of God. Romans chapter 1 through 8 details God's plan of grace through His beautiful Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and how He accomplished redemption. In chapter 9, we saw the freedom of God's grace that He puts this mercy upon whom He chooses and whom He desires. In chapter 10, we saw the extent of God's grace that it now goes to the world, to all who will call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. Chapter 11 now, we're looking at the history of God's grace and how He works throughout redemptive history and then in chapters 12 through 16, we're going to look at the, the response to God's grace, the necessary response to God's grace, and how we will live and follow after Him who have beheld this grace. So let's go to God and, and praise Him and thank Him for this marvelous grace. Oh God, how matchless, how wonderful, how marvelous is Your grace. And I thank You for what we've been learning in the book of Romans. And I thank You that we just stand amazed. And we look at you and we worship you. For it is from you, through you, and to you are all things. To you be the glory forever. Amen. I pray this morning, Lord, I feel such a deep need in my own heart and the hearts of everyone here this morning for the fruit of what Paul is laboring in in this word. And it's for a deep humility in every child of God. And so, Lord, I pray now, cut down pride. This whole gospel is designed to just rip it out, to diminish it, to take it away from the children of God. Lord, just let there be no pride and boasting in ourselves and cockiness. Bring just deep, sweet humility to all the children of God. To be done with their own plans and programs, to be caught up in, in yours, to give their lives, that your name and your kingdom is bigger and their own wants and hurts and needs. God, let them be swallowed up in something bigger than their own lives this morning. God, let us see how our own individual specific lives are brought into your big plan and just do mighty things, do more than we could hope, think, or ask. This morning, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we're currently looking at the question in Romans 11.1, 1, has God rejected his people, and Paul is saying, by no means perish the thought. We saw the answer was no from the remnant throughout the history of the world that God had been calling out from Israel. There was always a spiritual Israel throughout him calling out Abraham. But what about the rest of the nation? God chose this nation for himself, and we've seen now at the time of this writing that the majority of them have been hardened. And the purpose, we'll see in verse 32, it's for mercy. It's for mercy to gather in the nations during this time. And purpose, further purpose, Paul said, is that we might provoke the Jews to jealousy as we behold their Savior. And we look for this mass salvation of Israel at the end of the history for those who follow me in that argument. And I know there are some who do not, but we all rejoice in the fullness of, of God bringing in Jew and Gentile as a saving God in verse 32. Now Paul is going to deal with something really big this morning. Verses 16 through 24, he's going to tackle the issue of pride. And just real simply, God hates pride. Proverbs 7 things he hates. One of them is pride. And what we'll see this morning, all of God's working throughout history is to take down pride and exalt him. It's just to destroy pride. It's, it's hated. It's an evil thing. The whole gospel is all of him to remove any pride from us humans. So we boast only in grace alone. We boast only in the cross 
of Jesus Christ. Grace is to make humble worshipers of the God of all grace. A proud Christian is an oxymoron. God says, I stand in battle array against the proud, and I give grace to the humble. It flows into humble hearts and humble spirits. And yet it is the air we breathe in our country and unfortunately in our own lives. It's been the history of the Jewish nation. God set his covenantal love upon them, and it brought great blessing to have God do that. But great pride set into this nation. And they began looking down on all the nations and the Gentiles, and there's a pride that grew up in their own righteousness that they were good enough to merit the favor of God. And they're looking down on others, and that had to be dealt with. <coughs> and God has brought a death blow to it with a partial hardening that we've been learning in Romans 11. With the ingathering of what they called dogs, the Gentiles, and they're coming into the promise that was made to Abraham that through your seed, I'm going to bless the nations. And, and so he's bringing them in, all the people they looked down and condescended, and they're not being brought in through circumcision and, and becoming Jewish, but the circumcision of the heart by the Holy Spirit through faith in Jesus Christ alone, they have been humbled. I will take away the kingdom, Jesus said, and give it to a nation bearing the fruit of it. We see the destruction of Israel in 70 AD where they're just wiped out. And now as Paul's going to say in this section that they're enemies of the gospel for your sake. But this section that, that we take up this morning, I just want you to hear this. It's not about humbling Israel. It's about humbling the Gentiles. It's our great need now as the objects of God's grace. Pride has grown up into us and we need to be humbled. Isn't that amazing? The gospel that we've been studying for three and a half years produces pride instead of deep, deep humility. Or all glory be to God. I'm a debtor to all men. I look down on no one because I'm the greatest of sinners. Gentiles now looking down on Israel, haughty. It's all about us now. You're second class citizens now. How's it feel? Dogs, it's all about me now. And it spills over into this kind of stuff. I'm a Baptist. No, I'm a Lutheran. I'm Presbyterian. My grandpa was a minister. I was baptized. I'm a premillennialist mid-trip. I'm an all-millennialist. I don't have 27 different judgments and charts for man to follow. I vote conservative. I'm a liberal. We care about the poor. We don't marginalize them. Pride just bubbles up and Gentiles all over the place, oozing out of our mouths and our hearts, looking out at other people with contempt. Look at those poor sinners. They're not as righteous as me. Anti-Semitism. I'm the only one who can figure out the flow of the Bible in the end times. I wish you all could get it together like me. <clears throat> I break fellowship with those who can't dot every I and cross every T with end times. Guys, this is broken. For a God who says, I'm a pro opposed to the proud, but give grace to the humble. Paul needing to take all these verses this morning to deal with our pride is big. And some of you have missed all of Romans. And Romans 8, through this gospel, he says, now you're able to keep the requirement of the law, to get to the very essence of what the law was about, to love God and to love other people. And, and this whole gospel is to produce that, and it's producing pride. The opposite of the whole, what God wants from his children. And now you lack love and you look down on others who don't tie it all together the way you do. Spend a life, you've spent a whole life dividing over non-essential things. Just your whole life. All the fruit you could have bore not doing that. Looking down on others. Saying I'm the only person who understands the whole counsel of God. I don't throw out parts of the Bible like other can'ts. The pride in the things that I have seen in my day and in my own heart to my shame. We need this section more than we know. God have mercy on us and humble us deeply here this morning for the pride of privilege that we carry around. And I'm just asking that everyone walk out of here this morning in the right place. With God where he should be, where we should be, and what God would do with humility and a whole body of Christ. Look with me in verse 16 where we left off. 
It's kind of our transition verse. Last week we saw where to make uh, the Jews jealous by treasuring Christ. And even to make Gentiles jealous by how sweet it is what comes out of knowing Jesus Christ. And now he says that the first piece of dough is holy. The lump is also, and if the root is holy, the branches are <coughs> too. So we got these and ifs twice in this verse. And in the Greek, it, it assumes it's true for the sake of argument. And so Paul's going to give two pictures here, uh, the first fruit of a lump and the root of an olive tree with branches. And so let's look at this first piece of a lump. It literally means first fruits. And I see it coming from Numbers 15, 17. Let me read it. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, when you enter the land where I bring you, then it shall be that when you eat of the food of the land, you shall lift up an offering to the Lord. Of the first of your dough, you shall lift up as a cake, as an offering. As the offering of the threshing floor, so you shall lift it up. From the first of your dough, you shall give to the Lord as an offering throughout your generations. And it's interesting that those words there are in the Septuagint, the, uh, the Hebrew translation, the Greek translation of the Old Testament uses those words. And so the first piece of the dough is that initial offering and it was holy because it was dedicated to God. And so Paul argues from the holiness of the lump, and he says because of the, the first fruits, that it's holy, it's set apart to him. And to get a full understanding of where we're going this morning, he uses a second metaphor, and the rest of the section he's going to spend on this metaphor. So I'm not going to get stuck on the dough. I want to move into the tree because he's going to explain where he wants to go with it. So the second one is that if a root of this olive tree be holy, the branches are holy. <clears throat> so Paul pulls out an illustration of the old olive tree. A uh, good precedence, just a quick verse. Hosea 14, 6, his shoots will sprout and his beauty will be like the olive tree and his fragrance like the cedars of Lebanon. So the beautiful olive tree. And the first question then for me is, what is the root? He says the root is holy. So as we look at this tree, what does that mean? And in our context, the patriarchs, he's going to say, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is the root of the Jewish nation. So they have been holy. They've been set apart by God. And they were set apart as God called out Abraham. And he chooses them to be this nation that he's going to work out his covenantal workings through the Old Testament. And the possibly the, the root is in the singular, so it might be the root is just Abraham himself. Abraham is this root. And it would make sense that these are the first fruits, so the, the rest of the lump will be holy. God calls out that nation. I just want to read a few verses to you. Romans 4.13, for the promise to Abraham or to his descendants that he would be heir of the world was not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Verse 16 of chapter 4 for this reason, it's by faith that it might be in accordance with grace in order that the promise may be certain to all the descendants who have faith, not only to those who are of the law, but to those who are of the faith of, father, of Abraham, who's the father of us all. Galatians 3.14, in order that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith, believing the gospel. Romans eleven twenty eight 28, from the standpoint of the gospel, they, the Jews, are enemies for your sake, but from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. And so Israel is a nation that has been set apart. They've been made holy for God. And they were set apart by a promise that was made to Abraham, that I'm going to make you a great nation and I'm going to bless the nations through your seed, which Paul tells us is Jesus Christ. And so the blessing is going to come to all the nations through this seed who's going to come into the world born of a virgin. And so the rich root, we have the law was given, Paul says, to lead you to the promises that in the seed, Jesus, you might find salvation. So in the new covenant, the seed entered the world, Jesus and he came and he fulfilled the law so that those who have the faith of Abraham now are brought into this rich root of salvation by grace through faith 
in Christ alone. So Paul wants Gentiles now to guard against arrogance. And I tell you, if there's anything that will not provoke the Jews to jealousy, hold your salvation with pride and arrogance. I've never seen a good evangelist full of pride. The, the ones who come humble and broken, the greatest of sinners, are the ones that God uses. Proud people are the worst evangelists. They make no one jealous for what they have. They make them glad that they're not like you. You just strengthen their resolve against God and the gospel. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. So what Paul is going to do this morning is he's going to set forth three arguments so that the Gentiles would not be haughty. And I did my homework. It's going to come up on the screen right now. Right now. There it is. The first one is in verses 17 through 18, he says, remember your roots. The second one is to reflect on God's dealings. In verses 19 through 22, the severity and the kindness of God. And then he's going to say thirdly in verses 23 through 24, recognize Israel's hope. So let's look at the first way to, to be humbled, to not be haughty. Gentiles, remember your roots. Verse 17, but if some of the branches were broken off and you being a wild olive were grafted in among them and became partakers with them of the rich root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant. So but if, again, assumes for the, true for the sake of argument, but if some of the branches were broken off, and that was what we saw the last time in verses 11, 1 through 10, they were broken off, they, they were hardened. Now there's a tree with a few branches on it. Most have rejected. The majority of the nations rejected Jesus, the Messiah. There's these elect chosen ones that saw it, Mary and them, and they get it, and they're sticking in this tree. But the divine chainsaw came out, and it cut off the majority of the branches. I want you to catch this. God did not cut down the whole tree. He cut down the branches. There is still a remnant. And he says he's going to take a wild olive branch. We're grafted into this tree among the elect branches that are in it, Jewish. And the elect Gentiles, I love it. It it says they're wild. (laughs) That was me. You're a wild man. You're uncultivated. You're unattended. You grew up in the wilderness. Israel, I planted, I watered, I I hewn out rocks, I cultivated them, I expected good fruit, and all I got was worthless fruit. But you Gentiles were just wild, unattended, uncared for. It's a good picture of a Gentile. I love it. God said, I wasn't your caretaker. And what Paul is saying, Gentiles, you ready? Remember your roots. They're not good. You were alien and strangers to the promise of God. You were without God and you had no hope in this world. You lived for your lust, your pleasures, your lies. You walked according to the course of the world. You were spiritually dead. And you were objects of God's wrath. Our root was Adam. And Adam plunged us all into ruin back to Romans chapter 5. In him we all sinned and death spread to all men. You were wild olive branches. Do you remember Ephesians 2.11, therefore remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, (coughs) who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, the Jews, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. And so there, there, there weren't waters of mercy flowing to you. You were outsiders to the mercy and covenantal love of God. That's our root. And you're looking down on Israel, and he says, remember your roots. You're looking down on the homeless, the immoral, those lost in cults, uneducated, educated. There's just this pride of looking down. Remember your roots. Look at the two leading verbs here. We're broken off and we're grafted in. They're they're both what are called divine passives. God did this. Salvation is by grace. We were wild olive branches and we were grafted in among them 
and we became partakers with the rich root of the olive tree. Wild olive branches, Gentiles, were grafted into this cultivated olive tree. We became a fellow sharer in the rich root of the olive tree. In Abraham, I will bless the nations. I will do all the work necessary through the seed that will come to bring about salvation. I've been grafted into that promise by faith. Heirs of promise. What does that do to you? You've been grafted into this promise by grace. When God made the covenant with Abraham, only one party walked through those animals split in half. I'll do everything necessary to fulfill the covenant, Abraham. You won't. I was in the heart of God when he walked through those animals. The promise to bless the nations through the seed of Jesus Christ. Catch the word, you were made partakers with them. This is an intensified form. You've heard of the word koinonia, which means fellowship. This, uh, it meant to share, to have commonality, oneness, but uh, there's a, a soon on the front, which makes it a compound, and it, it intensifies the word even deeper. You've been brought in to have joint participation, oneness, and fellowship in this tree. Philippians 1, 7, for it's only right for me to feel this way about you because I have you in my heart, Philippi, since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers of grace with me. Same word, you've been brought in to partake of grace with us. Joint participation, applying to the remnant Jewish branches, the spiritual Israel that we saw in chapter 9. And so the key to the whole argument is the good root. There's nothing that the wild branch has to offer. Branches don't boast. A wild branch is dependent upon the root. And so verse 18, if you'll look with me, do not be arrogant then toward the branches. But if you are arrogant, remember that it's not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. The root of fatness. Jesus said, you worship that which you do not know. We worship that which we know for salvation is from the Jews. Our salvation flows from a Jewish salvation of a promise made to Abraham. The sap of our salvation, of what Jesus is and what he will do. You have not supplanted Abraham. You've been taking from a dead root and you've been joined to this one. The gracious implanting of God the Father into Jesus Christ for every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Into this rich root, the promise that he made to Abraham thousands of years ago is mine to be blessed in his seed. And pride, the greatest of humility and gratitude should spring up this morning. Nothing of pride. You don't support the root. The Abrahamic promise is what supports you. And I can remind you again, te telestai, it's finished. What is there to boast in of a God who does everything for your salvation because you can't do anything? Listen to this. Paul writes to Titus, Titus 3, 3 through 5. For we also once were foolish ourselves, Gentiles, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. But when the kindness of God, our Savior, and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us. Not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. Robert Haldane said, all the difference between mankind is the grace of God. I boast in nothing but the grace of God. So remember your roots. Be humble before your God. Marvel that wild olive plants were grafted in to this cultivated olive tree by grace through faith. Reflect secondly on God's dealings in verses 19 through 22. Verse 19, you will say then, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. 
quite right. They were broken off. Why? <clears throat> For their unbelief. But you stand by your faith. Don't be conceited, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either, Gentile. Behold then the kindness and the severity of God. To those who fell severity, but to you, God's kindness. If you continue in his kindness, otherwise you also will be cut off. Father, I pray that we would get the fullness of what these verses are. God, let them touch every heart here now. Bring humility through these words. Amen. So what you got here is this. Branches are broken off. The bulk of the Jewish nation is in unbelief. And there's a danger of pride and a danger of despising Jews. And the kind of this feeling, because I'm a Gentile, I'm just part of the church all as well. Not a lot of Gentiles running around boasting, I'm Jewish, I'm circumcised, I keep the law, I'm in. We say things like, once saved, always saved. We say things like, let us sin that grace might abound. America thinks we're the people of God now. And we just feel that we pray some little ditty and we're in, no worries, live any way you want, live like hell and it doesn't matter. I did my formula. I'm good. Everybody else out there is bad. They're not as good as me. I'm not like these Jews who rejected Jesus. I prayed to him 38 years ago and I'm safe. I got my fire insurance. Don't be telling me about Jesus. Paul's going to smash this pride between the eyes and he's just going to say, fear. The product of haughtiness. No humility. No fear, no reverence for the severity of God fills our land. We have audacity, boldness, arrogance. We talk back to God. We counsel him. Fear's gone. No one fears the chainsaw anymore. No one believes that their heart can be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. I see dead branches everywhere, doggedly sure that I'm in because of something 20 years ago. I see smugness, complacency all over, because what we're going to look at this morning is just lost. You don't talk about these things unless you preach verse by verse, and you have to. When you, look, when you get up in the morning, you don't say, okay, what am I going to preach on Sunday? How about God cutting off branches and fearing? <clears throat> so come wrestle with these words this morning the forgotten words of the 20th, 21st century church is fear. Fear what? Perfect love drives out all fear. I'll show you what we're supposed to fear. Well, I think we've recovered the imminence of God, the nearness, and we've lost his transcendence. Just go turn on the Christian radio and you'll know what I'm talking about. Everything is just about feeling and nearness. And it used to be where it was just about his transcendence and there was no Abba, Father, and we've recovered Abba Father and we've lost that God's holy, who he is. Branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. Why has this happened? We must be superior to them. They were broken off so we could come in. And the answer's in verse 20. Quite right, they were broken off for their unbelief. But you stand by your faith. The rejecting Jews are no longer in the olive tree, um, so your deduction's entirely wrong, Gentile. The Jews thought they were superior because of their nationality, and now Gentiles are doing the same thing. The minute you start thinking that, you begin to deny the Christian gospel. And so the key in this verse is unbelief and faith. It's not your nationality, it's not your upbringing, it's not your merit. It's not that you're smarter, and it's not your morality. All that matters is they were cast off, not because they were Jews, but because of their unbelief. And Gentiles were brought in, not because they were so wonderful, but because God gave them the gift of faith. They're broken off for their unbelief. Here's their Messiah. They kill him. They reject him. They say, we don't want the cornerstone. They stumble. And so the chainsaw comes out, and they're cut off. You stand by faith. 
Jude one twenty four. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy. To the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Romans 5.1, therefore having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. We stand in grace, gospel of Jesus Christ. So you do not stand because you're a Gentile. And you do not stand because you're an American. And you don't stand because you're a Baptist. I stand by the grace of God alone that he has granted me faith to look only to him for everything. And I stand by faith which completely looks away from me and looks to Christ. I stand because I can't. And God has caused me to stand. So don't be conceited, but fear. And I'm going to say why. Well, verse 21, if God didn't spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. (coughs) For since God did not spare uh, natural branches greater to the lesser argument, if if he wouldn't spare his natural branches, you wild olive branches, why is he not going to spare you? If he pulled out the chainsaw on his natural branches, how much more unnatural branches? How can, you, how can we get so arrogant and presumptuous and so apathetic and so unafraid of sinning, looking down on others in smug pride and say, once in the tree, always in the tree? Charles Hodge put it well. He said, imagine a man who has a son. He looks to his son to carry on his name and his business and his inheritance. And so he did everything, all for his son and his well-being. And the son turns out to have bad character. He insults his dad. He goes into riotous living. And the dad realizes his son is gone. So he adopts a servant. And he puts him in the position of his son. Does the adopted servant say, Aha, I'm greater than the son. I can do whatever I want. There's just no thought of that. He says if he put away his natural son for ill behavior... How much more is adopted, son, is the argument. So the arrogant pride of the Jew is resting in themselves and they're resting in their own righteousness and he cut them off. How much more are you Gentiles? Don't be arrogant. Fear. Have a reverence for this God. How can we become arrogant when we have this incredible lesson in history with the natural branches and they were cut off for their unbelief. And we just kind of think we can be branches with no fruit. Have unbelief and it's no big deal. Everything's fine because I'm resting in a past decision. Quick question. I hope a couple of you are saying this. Pastor, are you saying we can lose our salvation? And I hope you know that I would never say that. We spent a long time in chapter 8. We spent a long time in every chapter, come to think of it. (laughs) But we labored hard for our eternal security and that nothing can snatch you out of God's hand and the love of Christ and his purpose to bring you to glory. We we spent a long time because that's living holy is going to spring from that assurance and that security and that confidence. So now are you saying that something can separate us from God's love? Can I be just taken out of the tree called salvation? I want you to hear this really clear. A believer cannot lose his or her salvation. Can't happen or God fails. That will not happen. But our dear Father has put warning passages throughout the Bible, like this one. He says, You can harden your heart. Don't do it. Don't drift away. Don't go apostate. They went out from us because they were never of us. God has a great purpose and reason for warnings in the Bible. And it's for children like me with remaining sin who get drowsy, arrogant, lazy, 
cold. I drift from my first love. And he gives me warnings that say, wake up. Wake up. Believers hear this and tremble. Wake me up, God. I'm playing with sin. I am so apathetic this morning. Oh, but once saved, always saved. No. Let this thing come and wake you up. We don't meander into heaven. Wake up. That's what he's calling us to. Behold, he says, behold, wake up, stop. How many need to hear this this morning? I did. Our great privilege has rocked us to sleep. We've we've been comforted in our rebellion and in our sin. And you need to hear an unnatural branch and a wild olive branch fear the chainsaw. He will not spare you either if you journey down the path of pride and unbelief. Don't go there. And so can a believer lose his salvation? No. Can an unbeliever walk away? You better believe it. And can believers get into places where they need to be slapped and say, wake up, wake up. God preaches his mercy and says, wake up. I'm so merciful. My kindness And then he pulls out chainsaws and says, I'm severe. Wake up. He'll use everything to keep guiding his children to glory. Even warning passages. So this morning, your pastor's begging, wake up. Don't just sit here as cocky, Gentile branches going, those poor Jews. They don't get it like me. Just apathetic and lazy. Wake up. Wake up. Arrogant, prideful, and looking down on everybody. Wake up. How can we be arrogant? Believers, run to the cross when you hear this. And you look to the Holy Spirit to empower you to keep yourselves in the love of Christ and to walk in his ways and the obedience of faith that we're learning in Romans. If you hear this this morning and go, I guess you don't have watches. You look at your phone. (laughs) When's he going to be done? What's for lunch? Daddy, are are we going to go to Black IP? Fear. Wake up. Jeremiah, God says, I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do them good. That's the kindness of God. And I will put the fear of me in their hearts so that they will not turn away from me. God will put a fear in your heart of him so you won't turn away. The reason you're still walking with Christ, he put that in the new covenant into your heart and I can't walk away from this God. Praise be to God. I got all my remaining sin and a God who keeps leading me to repentance and his mercies bringing me back and his warnings bringing me back and he just keeps me on the path. It's grace. If it wasn't, this branch would have been buzzed off a long time ago. Are you with me? God uses threats to persevere us safe to glory. The question is, were they in the tree or not? They they were in this outward, spiritual, formal attachment to the covenant people. There were Jews that were circumcised and doing all these things that were not redeemed. And there's tares sitting here this morning that look like everybody else, but you're not joined to the root. And you're just dead, little attached. I come, I'm part of the church, I've been baptized. That's what was going on. So it's just, you're not, once you're in that tree, you're not coming out with the rich root. Okay, so it's an illustration showing you that unbelief gets cut out and faith comes in. So you're not going to lose your salvation. <clears throat> Inward, real, authentic, sap, enjoying attachment to the tree that's real. Dead branches, no fruit, not real. You know what it looks like. So there were people in Israel who were offering sacrifices and being circumcised and keeping the law from their, not from their hearts, that were not children of Abraham. And so today there are people who got baptized and all you did was get wet. You come to church, you have communion, 
and you're moral and you're not children of Abraham because you don't have faith in the root. God uses his mercy to persevere us to glory. If you look in our passage, he says, if we continue in his kindness. The severity of God, it doesn't say if we continue in his severity. If we continue in his kindness and the sweetness of this gospel and who he is and, and laboring by faith to behold him and treasure and love his Savior and love him and, and persevere in this great kindness that's come to us in the gospel. So let's look at behold in verse 22. Behold, the kindness and the severity of God to those who fell severity, but to you, God's kindness. Otherwise, you'll be cut off. So behold that kindness. That has been the book of Romans. Everything we've seen, I just, Romans 2, 4, it's your kindness that leads us to repentance. Behold the kindness of God and behold the severity of God. But to you, God's kindness, if you continue in his kindness, otherwise you'll be cut off. So if you continue in his kindness, if you stand in faith, we don't sit arrogant. We fight the good fight of faith. And, and those continue. This is not losing your salvation. That's what this whole argument is about. The whole argument was about that nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. He's fighting for your eternal security. Okay, that's what this whole argument's coming from. It's showing you that God loses none of his own. Rather, it's that this warning will wake us up from pride and complacency and resting and privilege and believe and stay in that kindness daily. So to be humble, remember your roots, Gentiles, and reflect on God's dealing with severity and kindness. And then lastly, recognize Israel's hope in verse 23. And they also... If they do not continue in their unbelief, the Jewish nation will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. Yeah, but you don't graft back in dead branches. It's impossible. Anyone ever try it? You can't do it. But I love what the rich young ruler, <coughs> God says with men, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. The God who is able and he can take these dead branches, and the way I interpret this, with this mass revival at the end of history, all these dead branches, God's going to say live. And they're going to be grafted back in to this tree by faith and the promised seed that was given to Abraham. God is able to graft them in again. And that is why Christ said, unless you're born again, you won't enter the kingdom of God. Dead branches must be made alive. And this is supernatural. It's not a natural process. It's contrary to nature. A dunatos is the word. It's, it's equivalent to uh, dunamis, which we saw the gospel is the dunamis, the power of God. He's able to do this. And in verse 24, I'm going to finish up. For if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree and were grafted contrary to nature into this nice cultivated olive tree, how much more Will these who are the natural branches, Jews, be grafted into their own olive tree? How much more? Don't be haughty and think that everything revolves around Gentiles and recognize Israel's future here, what he's talking about. And so what I see in this beautiful section is this one God with one promise of salvation made to Abraham, with one seed and one Savior who would come and do everything necessary for salvation, with one faith, I believe. And, and he makes them one new people in Ephesians 2. Jew and Gentile now become one in Christ with one eternal destiny, all humbled, Jew and Gentile, looking to the grace of God alone. And if we can't come together on that holy ground, something's wrong. And none of that depends on what you think is going to happen with Israel in the future or not. But those things, if you deny those things in the, the fullness of what Romans has revealed, you're going to miss something really, really important. And, and sometimes there's a fear 
of this one new man and the glory of what God's doing in faith and the seed of Abraham. Like what we have here is unbelievable. All the nations, some Jews, we, this is beautiful what God has done here and that is our unity and what brings us together. Do not divide up what God has done. And so listen to this. Don't make the New Testament plan B. Romans 11 is plan A. And when you make it plan B, your, your great mind has now hurt very much the redemptive flow of history. Don't do that. God's telling you, this is my plan. It's always been my plan. We went all the way back to the Old Testament scriptures to say, this is what my plan is. I'm going to bring in Gentiles. I'm going to harden Jews. This is God's plan. It's all plan A so that I can show mercy to Jew and Gentile. And, and we're going to get there, but I, I'm just going to go there now. <laughs> I'll close with this. God wants to shut up everybody in disobedience, Jew and Gentile. So there's no boasting of anything in you so that all the glory from him, through him, and to him are all things to God be the glory forever. The need of every soul here right now is to have God's plan. God is the center of your life, your heart, your everything. Every sin is trying to make you back to be God and be at the center. And everything in this Bible is to keep breaking your pride and getting you to quit making me the sun and all you people revolving around me and always being upset because everybody won't love me enough and make me God. The whole Lord's Prayer is start, put God where he belongs. Hallowed be his name, his kingdom come. Our Father who art in heaven, all these glorious things. Get him where he belongs and then all three of your needs are unto him. Give me my daily bread so I can serve you. Forgive me of my sins so I can dwell with you and don't let me enter into sin so I can make much of you. I just, what, what we need is to quit making all this about you. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So I pray everything God's doing in history is to break our pride so he would get all the praise and glory and honor. And so if you're just sitting here proud of yourself and patting yourself and condescending everybody else smarter than anyone in the world, just stop. Come to Jesus where everything is humbled and broken and God did it all, and it's all for his praise and all for his glory. And this is no longer about me. I get to live now for him and his plan and his glory and his program. Isn't that freeing? We can be set free of our audacious pride that what this would do for marriages and churches and evangelism and friends and neighbors. You know what smells more than anything in this world right now is it's pride. And you, st you start sending out Christians in humility with this message, and it'll, it'll change the world. But go out there with your little battery on your shoulder, how you're better than everybody else, and smarter, and all those things, and you'll never see anyone come to Christ. So I pray that we get this. And if you've walked in here this morning in humility, look to Jesus Christ for your salvation to have all your sins washed away and to be joined to the vine and to bear fruit from Jesus. And if you've come in, just all that warning passage was for you. You, you might have never been attached to the vine. And I don't care if you got 30 years of religion going this morning, repent and turn to Jesus Christ and be saved. And if you've just gotten drowsy as a believer, I've been praying for you, wake up. Fear the chainsaw. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for our eternal security and that nothing, hell itself, can't snatch us out. Our own pride can't snatch us out. I thank you for that, but I thank you that you warn us to not become haughty, to not make everything about us and be fighting and arguing everybody and taking them down and proving everything that we, we got it. God, humble us. Humble men and women and children bringing a humble Christ for a salvation to the uttermost. God, let that be the air we breathe here at Southside Bible Church. Lord, let the aroma of this place be humility and that much is made of you, that all we can boast in is grace. 
that you grafted a wild branch into an olive tree of promises made to Abraham. Oh God, I thank you for your grace. I got nothing to boast in except Jesus Christ. That's in his precious name that we do pray. Amen.